first off, congratulations. Thank you, man. Thank I just want to say thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support of Art and Soul. Thank you for your support of the Perez Art Museum Miami over time. And especially this year, as we congratulate you all and um, just, just honor the feat that it is to be sitting here another beautiful day at Rooster. Um, yeah, I mean, no, I mean, I, I want to say thank you. You know, I think that um, even the, the idea of launching something like Rooster, you know, Marcus and I always considered the work that you were doing at PAM as a way to really sort of have a model for how to be, um, you know, disruptive, how to be um, innovative, inclusionary, um, artistic, um, interesting, fun, cool, all those things. So I just, um, I'm really, really impressed and admired in the way that you've impacted the city, Thanks. not just the city, but people who come to the city. Um, and uh, Pam is just such an amazing institution. So thank you for um, being a resource. Thank you. Being a, a friend. And now, you know, we're going to partner and do things I'm together. So I'm just glad. I'm excited to to be a friend and to, and to be working with you, brother. You, you came to New York in the late 90s, right? In 99. Okay. And was still working through. I, I love that bridge you gave between real estate and this idea of, of, of what ownership might mean within a specific community. Um, were you always in Harlem? Well, I initially, when I first moved to New York, I was in Brooklyn, Fort Greene, and then uh, moved to Harlem, uh, where my husband and I, you know, built and established our life together and and we uh you know uh later you know had a family um and and so when marcus and i initiated red rooster harlem in 2010 yeah um i'd already been living in harlem uh and so um the real estate opportunity to again create this destination that was collaborative with the studio museum i'm learning how these things are so vitally connected, yeah. the real estate, the restaurant, and it, and it means so much specifically here. But how, what is the bridge for you personally between the real estate to the restaurant, to the hospitality business? Yeah, I mean, I think that places, um, so, you know, the way that neighborhoods and communities organically come together, yeah. you know, through space, but also structurally come together. So real estate becomes this application for allowing a community to express itself, to really sort of be distinct yeah. and different. And so because I'd been doing like master planning and neighborhood development, you know, large scale stuff, and then to come into the restaurant, one small place and uh, look at how that could be a catalytic force for a community through the art, yeah. through the music, through the culinary, you know, that was what, it was just like a whole new world for me um, to dive into. And so, um, yeah, it was like, and then like an artistic expression, you know. And art and culture has always been a part of, of that experience. It's amazing to see that. And I mean, you mentioned Studio Museum in Harlem and the proximity, right? Because what we're talking about is the proximity of Studio Museum and Rooster Harlem is like, I don't know, uh, 500 feet, yeah. 500 yards, something like that. Three blocks. Right? Three blocks. And, and so there is that, that, that vital connection to community there that you've experienced. How did Overtown even come into play? Like, how did this whole idea of Miami come into play? Yes. Yes. So, um, you know, as... Harlem was living and breathing um, and on its own journey, doing well. Um, I was approached uh, by a colleague, uh, Joanne Rosen, and you know, who uh, was a property owner here and said, mm -hmm. hey, you know, uh, I've got some development ideas in Miami. I want you to check out. I've been to Florida, I mean, to Miami sure. um, and had come to Overtown, but not really spent a lot of time. Did some research and realized that Overtown was named the Harlem of the South. And that organic connection between the spirit of music, um, you know, the fact that a lot of our icons had spent so much time here That's right. in Overtown, it just felt like a natural connection. So then when the opportunity 
came to, to partner with, with Michael Simpkins. Um, the CRA was very excited about me uh -huh. coming in and, and doing that similar work that had happened in Harlem. Okay. You know, it became that transactional process, but then really the spiritual journey of saying this uh, community deserves yeah. and needs the kind of attention, um, creative force yeah. uh, and, and real estate uh, push yeah. that could just totally, you know, uh, take it to another place. So that was the beginning okay. you know, of the journey. So I know you have to do a certain amount of research at that point. And I just want like thinking historically, right? We have been in Lennox Lounge before there was a rooster, right? And you mentioned Clyde Killen's pool hall here before we are here today. Yeah. So place in history is obviously of the utmost importance. When you started working on this project five years ago or so, how did you immerse yourself? How did you find it? Yeah, I mean, I uh, got here and um, learned about the Black Archives here at the Lyric Theater and just immersed myself, went there and spent days um, studying and researching. Wow. And then I started to meet people here in Overtown people who've lived here for the last four decades and just having conversations with them. And then when I learned that this building, the Clyde Killens Pool Hall, was one of the stomping grounds, mm. you know, so, you know, when folks couldn't stay on the beach right. because of the color and they had to come to Overtown to, uh, you know, stay and have a hotel and, and have a nightlife experience, that the Clyde Killens Pool Hall was one of the primary destinations. So mm. learning that Muhammad Ali and Ella Fitzgerald and Aretha Franklin and, you know, uh, Sam Cooke, Sammy Davis right. used to hang out in this building. That's crazy. Right. And so <laughs> and unfortunately, so many of the other places that they used to hang out on the little Broadway, Second Avenue are gone. And so this is one of the last physical representations of a magical era. Right. You know, and so for me to be a developer and have the opportunity to sort of take that story to another level. Um, absolutely. So you've assembled a variety of work here, but incredible artists, Derek Adams, Kara Walker, Micheline Thomas, others, the Astor Gates, um, Rasheed Johnson. Purvis Young, yep. Mm -hmm. Come on, man. Pur and Purvis, who of course lived right up the street. Um, just, just comment a little bit on that. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like walking into a little museum type situation <laughs> i'm trying to keep i'm, I'm trying to stay in your conversation it. brother i'm trying to stay in your conversation um yeah i mean i think that that you know as you and i have talked about before i think that that uh opportunity to share the excellence of the community of the culture right that's really what the art does i mean you know it's interesting now that the discussion around African-American artists is sort of like a thing and it's in vogue and people are starting to pay attention and give, True. you know, just due to something that really should have been a, uh, Absolute. a known quantity. But the, the art becomes an opportunity to express the excellence of the culture. Yeah. And, you know, Marcus and I are really blessed um, to have developed relationships, personal relationships with a lot of these artists. So Derek Adams is a friend, you know what I mean? McLean is a friend, you know, and, and then our relationship with Thelma really became a foundation for how we, our lens, you know, how we look at this and, and appreciate the depth of the work, you know? And so I just wanted people, Marcus and I wanted, want people to come into this space and be moved, uh, to be, to be kind of touched you know, and like you said, like your eye comes like, whoa! I didn't see that the last time I was here. And whoa, yeah. what is that? And and so it'll evolve. It'll, you know, yeah. um, but it is about having an experience, you know, so that's what it's about. I mean, you've also done some really interesting things in terms of giving us a taste of, of where we are and a taste of the neighborhood. Um, yeah. You, you know, it so, yeah. So when we in the design process of the of the building of the, of the space, you know, it was important to have the reference point was, you know, the Caribbean community that yeah. is here, has been here, 
It's the African American, it's the African community, you know, that has lived and breathed and made this place special and historic. Um, but also Miami, yeah. right? Just the real open, airy, For you sure. know, warmth of, of Miami. And so really putting all those things together and then being inspired by like, oh, well, Muhammad Ali and Aretha Franklin, if they walk through these doors, how would I want them to feel? Yeah. What kind of elegance would I want them to, you know, exude and, and, and take in? Um, so that became like, you know, every day that I walked in this building as I was designing and building, um, it just became like my, my northern star, you yeah. know? So uh, hopefully people come in and they feel a, bit, a little bit of that, like, bygone. For sure. But then it takes them to, like, you know, us and our community, the next. Exactly. Amazing. I mean, congratulations. Big congrats that we are here. 920 Northwest 2nd Street. Northwest 2nd Avenue, yeah. Northwest 2nd Ave, Overtown. And we are a few blocks walking distance away from American Air, well, the arena yep. where the Miami Heat play. And a few blocks away from Pam, the Perez Art Museum, Miami. A few blocks away from the Arsht. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. a lot going on. No, I know. But it's, you know, in the context of this place being ne so neglected, yeah. so marginalized yeah. for so many decades, that now, throughout the entire city of Miami, this little place, this old pool hall, uh, which is, you know, I've <laughs> reinvented, is the is a primary destination for safety yeah. and for consciousness um, and for comfort, right? So, you know, people have said many things about Overtown. A few things that they've said about them is that it is a sanctuary. And so the fact that, you know, we've been able to create a cultural sanctuary here, blocks away from Pam, you know, that is, you know, that for the neighborhood, not for anyone else, but for the yeah. pride and the chest, you know, like, substance of the neighborhood being able to say like us too yeah. like we matter we contribute to the city in a positive way exactly exactly yeah so that's and that's what feels really good yes and, and you said something in line with that I, I you said developers have options do you make the bottom line fatter or do you make the culture just as important um seems like you're able to do both I'm trying working it's, brother it's working amazing. brother and i'm just excited to have you Franklin, as uh, as a partner yes. in this journey, you know, of being um, representing the culture and, you know, hopefully in a, in a way of excellence. But um, like I said being innovative and disruptive. Yes, I love when you use that word because <laughs> we must. No, we absolutely must. And, and that's what we're, you know, we're celebrating. We're celebrating our fund for African-American art. But what we're really celebrating is is community, like you said. It's one thing to be able to put the artworks up on the wall and you and I know the artist and we can appreciate that, but, but what does it do? And when you put it in different spaces and you bring people together around it, that's when it's doing something, so. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. <laughs> I really So I'm going to jump right in. Jump right in. I, we met for the first time at Aqua V. I know you won't remember this. Mm -hmm. It must have been early 2000s because I was still in New York and we were at Thelma. Mm -hmm. It was lunchtime. And I'm just wondering, I think it's a beautiful entry point into talking about you. And, mm -hmm. and really, we want to honor you and your story. So when did you when did you first arrive in Sweden? Because obviously that is the, the glue in many ways that brought you to New York. Well, in a year of horrible events, right? I'm actually someone that I'm on the height of luck and goodness of others and but also trauma. I was born in a hut in Ethiopia. Me and my sister, the, I go to the hut every year and it's smaller than two restaurant tables put together. Mm. And I go there to get strength, but also to understand I, I came out of this place. Mm -hmm. We had tuberculosis, my sister, myself, my mom. Okay. My mother Pat, took us, walked us into a hospital. Wow. It happened to be a Swedish hospital. She passed away. Okay. 
And here's where luck comes into the picture and, and goodness of mm. other people. The nurse there, she had three kids on her own. She said, what's going to happen to these kids? Right. So she decided, she took us in, legal or not, she just took us. So wow. like, I know that I cannot put them back on the street. Wow. So she took us in. And then she also connected us eventually with the Swedish adoption agency. And that's how we went from being Kasahun, okay. which was my name, and Fantai, which uh -huh. was my sister's name, to Marcus and Linda. Amazing. And eight hours later, we were Swedish kids. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. Um, so within that story, um, it seems as though, you know, that as much as you had Sweden as a reference point yes. to get to New York, Africa, Ethiopia has been a very important part mm -hmm. of the conversation ever since even for some how, how did how did you maintain um those kind of ties uh being mm -hmm. in a place so different and at mm -hmm. such a young age well i think one of the things that i still don't think america and especially we have to give so much more credit to african americans in this country mm. for the world mm. So I'm a black kid with an odd family in Sweden. My signs of positivity of what's possible in the world come through American pop culture. Mm -hmm. Whether that was once a week through the Cosby show or right. whether that was reading Alex Haley's Malcolm or right. whether that was listening to Prince or even watching now with videos and stuff like that, mm -hmm. right? Or laughing at an understanding at a Murphy or my history teacher, Fab Five Freddy, mm. watching Joe MTV rap, understanding that outside New York, how America looked like, mm -hmm. right? So this happened in this country mm -hmm. and it continues to happen in this right. country through, yet we're not credited enough for that, but mm -hmm. for all the black population outside America, we, America is the string of hope for sure. icons, but also for every day. Sure. Someone, like you and me, mm -hmm. right? In very privileged situation. Absolutely. But we're here and we add value. Oh. So I think that was something that my parents not quite fully understood, uh -huh. but brought into our everyday. So if you went through my dad's or mom's record collection, uh -huh. you know, it was oh. Maria Makeba, Phila Kuti, wow. Bob, of course, but it was also Stevie, Michael, Diana, and when they came to town, my parents wow. bought tickets. So we, I saw Diana Ross with my, with my mother. Right. I went to Prince concert. Right. I saw Stevie. These were like cultural events for our family. Yeah. So it was my, you know, my parents being white, living in Sweden, a small citizen in Sweden, yeah. obviously could not, have not gone through an African-American experience, but understood positive images yeah. needed to be in front of their black kids. We're here at Rooster Overtown, and 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 obviously, the first time I was here uh, was a few weeks ago, and the experience, as mm. my experience in New mm. York, is mm. is one that is immersed in music. Mm -hmm. I did not, I don't remember eating a thing without also being mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, like, you know, and and so how how did that become? integral to to what it is you do um, and then i want to go back to how you became um a chef well frankly you are part of you are part of this you've been part of this journey for four or five years through derek and myself yeah because we knew we had an anchor with you we had a colleague we had a friend mm -hmm. we had somebody that would push us would say that's just not right mm -hmm. uh i think we can do better over here mm -hmm. and you know Thelma has been such an important part of my life yeah but also setting the aspiration of what rooster could be in new york mm -hmm. so this wouldn't happen without art and high ambition in art obviously the rebels and the simpkins are incredible collectors absolutely and we thank them for that but also to having a partner in it yeah like yourself that when when the astors in miami he comes to see sees it see us yeah and as black collaborators, 
it's so important in different fields mm -hmm. to have each other. Mm -hmm. So Red Rooster New York would not look like it. Those walls wouldn't be there without Thelma. Yeah. Our walls wouldn't be the same without you. Yeah. And then we think about the music aspect, right? Because yeah. when we present Rooster as its best, it's very local, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So the art has to be part of that conversation. Right. All the four or five versions of hospitality or blackness is presented here, right? Food as one aspect, service as one aspect, music as one, but the art. art and I'll tell you one that always, that both you and I know, yeah. that always is my hero, is Miss Leah Chase. Yes, indeed. Because when you enter Duke Chase in New Orleans, the first store is where mm. Mr. Duke had his Incredible sandwiches. Mm -hmm. But once you enter the other door, you right. come into the dining room. What's on those walls? Art. Jacob Lawrence, yeah. Romar Bearden, for example. Elizabeth Cowley. Right? And yeah. we can go on and on and on. So Miss sure. Leah was both an advocate yeah. and an activist at the same time. When I think sure. about what is our role being here in Overtown, is to be both creators of job opportunities, yeah. so people can realize their dream, but we have to be both advocate yeah. and activist at the same time. So true, so true. Obviously there, there's different um, characteristics to different places, but the relationship to Harlem and to restaurant culture and history there is something that you really um, had to contend with. Um, you know, as somebody who, who frequented Lennox Lounge mm -hmm, all sure. the time, right? We, we were like, what's going to happen? What, yeah. What's next? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you came in 2010, the restaurant opened, I believe, mm -hmm. right? Um, how did you prepare for that? You know, I mean, you mentioned Leah, but there's a bigger constellation. And I, and I think of places mm -hmm. like the lounge and I think of um, wh where else? Pan Pan, all these, you know, these places that, that are no longer there. These these trans transformations that have happened. Well. I have to answer it why I think there's an intersection yeah. of being an immigrant yeah. and being black. And I'm fortunate of being both. Yeah. I wouldn't be here without the rights of the civil rights movements, of the hard labor and work, and people fought for that. Mm. But also of the immigrant movement, right? And when you are an immigrant and you are a black person, and then we learn how to navigate. Yeah. Because we must. Yeah. And it's not something that we have to pivot because it's 2020. We've always, always. must. Uh, and I think when I decided to move from Midtown to Harlem, mm -hmm. which is only, it was only four miles. It's yeah. a nice walk. It's yeah. not far. Not far at all. But it's a different country. Yeah. It's a different country. Yeah. And my job, it was seven years, eight years between moving to Harlem mm -hmm. uh, and opening okay. Red Rooster. It was that long. And I had to, I felt every year we're not ready. Yeah. What do you mean you're not ready? You know how to cook. I said, no, I'm not ready. Yeah. It's not ready. And I, I'll tell you, I'm so lucky to live in Harlem because my neighbor and uncle down the street is somebody like Dapper Dan. Yeah. My auntie that shows black excellence constantly, yeah. someone like Lana Turner. Yeah. And so when you, if, if I need to understand, if you understand what a fly girl is, well, my friend is the original fly girl, Miss right. Bevy Smith. Gotcha. <laughs> That's right? for sure. So these are the icon, Thelma is down the road. Yeah. And you know, it is, you constantly around black excellence. Yeah. At all levels, and those are the known people. But, and also understanding and being humble enough to understand what you were doing in Midtown, yeah. you not, might not be able to trade on those skills here. Yeah. So the best cornbread was not in a pop-up restaurant and was not online. Yeah. Was actually, a matter of fact, not in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. It was the auntie that did it for the church. Right, right. And she, knowing which Sunday she would pop up or not was my job to figure that out. <laughs> Right? If I want to understand how to mm -hmm. get the best jerk chicken, yeah. well, I need to talk to 
Antoine and he was in the park every other Sunday unless it was raining and then he wasn't in the park yeah. and it was supposed to be that three but he really didn't set up until seven right it, it's a whole other world but once he put his his jerk on it was worth it right so I had to navigate and operate and understand that this is not going to be if I want to learn this mm -hmm. this is different mm -hmm. but it was also equally rewarding mm. so um, Brooklyn simultaneously everything happened online and it yeah. was pop-ups and it was you know there was this intersection between online and food started to happen sure Harlem I knew everything was underground or mystique and I'm like how do we upload this world of beauty and present it because yeah. that's essentially what Rooster does it presents yeah you know you I saw it a lot in Michael Jackson videos and Prince video mm -hmm. they presented to the world Moonwalk was already happening in the Bronx. Yeah, you know, exactly. like Madonna was presenting Vogue, but it's been happening totally. forever, right? Rooster, in many ways, is presenting. Uh huh. So I had to understand that. How do I present? Yeah. Black excellence. That's amazing. And and you do that with a foundation, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. And and it's so, it's so amazing to hear you talk about food. But it, I, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit the. The foundation that you come from to have been you know working in Lyon mm -hmm. um, to work at Aquavie and dealing with not only French cuisine but Swedish cuisine and Japanese and I worked Japanese. in Japan it's very very and informative to me how so so you've always had this pension for bringing together uh, different foundational aspects of cooking Mm. And I'm curious because because selfishly, I mean, I, I love the book, but yeah. how you have used Africa as mm -hmm. uh, a foundational aspect of your cooking. Well, I think, first of all, some of my dearest friends are people like amazing people, like my neighbor and dear friend is Julie Mirhato. We share Ethiopia, we sure. share Africanism. Sure. Sanford and I came up, Sanford Biggers and I came up in New York exactly at the same time, exactly. right? So he went to Poland, he went to Japan. Yeah. And just to sit, here's another, at that point, 25 year old that's going to Japan. Yeah. Well, I just came back from Japan and he went there. Yeah. And I was always more curious and having the conversation with the Derek Adams, with the Julie Moretto, with the Sanford Biggers. Yeah. We had different mediums, but the artist, was just as curious about what would they bring, what would they learn on these journeys, Absolutely. right? I did the same in food. Mm -hmm. So you gotta be uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but you're comfortable in that journey. Right. Africa, because I was adopted, culturally, I wasn't fluent. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn more about myself. So it wasn't really until the 2000s mm -hmm where I felt I created enough platform enough to be able to go there, right. fully go there. And when I went there, it went quickly. Gotcha. I met my father. Okay. Um, I traveled numerous, every trip. I went back to the continent, whether that was Morocco, Nigeria, yeah. uh, South Africa, yeah. the, the East Coast, not just Ethiopia, but the East Coast down. Mm -hmm. And I started cooking these places, mm -hmm. sometimes at events, sometimes not. Right. And it was, I started to become, not fluent, but I started to become, a, understand the nuances of Africa. Of mm -hmm. course, it's not one, it's plenty. But once I started to do that, and then compare yeah. that, if you ever had a jollof rice, yeah. and had a jambalaya, or if you ever had a dish coming from Nigeria, and looking at the food in the low country of South Carolina, mm -hmm. You have to see the similarities. Love it. And I didn't see them until I started to go back and forth and comparing notes. Right. And after that, I wrote a book in 2006 called Soul of a New Cuisine, yep. which was really for me to understand the link. I love it. And I didn't want to follow it up until the rise because I felt there needed to be enough time in between. Uh -huh. And now it wasn't my story anymore. It was. 55 or 100, 100 chefs yeah. that should tell their non monolithic journey. And that's how we land on the rise. I mean, that's the, the beautiful thing you mentioned, Solomon Cuisine, is 
you know, and I and I use the, the word Africa very specifically yeah. because you draw upon the very distinct flavors of every different place that you went through. Mm. Um, it's it's uh, it's phenomenal. Mm. Um, and then to think about that conversation, as you just alluded to, about rice and and its kind of transitional power in different yeah. places is is truly incredible. Mm -hmm. So, tell us a little bit about the menu mm -hmm. at Rooster. Tell oh, us wow. how you That's great. I get excited. There. Well, first of all, Rooster, it's not a concept. Mm -hmm. It's us. It's mm -hmm. of us. So, first, we had to study Florida and its relationship to blackness. And it has similarities to the North, but it's also very different. Right. The islands. Right. Right. Cuba, but also Bahamas, right? Jamaica, Haiti, yeah. all of it. So the Matunas, the waves of blackness here, it's part of the migration, yeah. but not only the migration. So it has a different Matuna, it's a different flow. Absolutely. To it. Then, so that's one aspect to understand and respect. We're also in a tropical environment. We have a yeah. tamarind tree, you know? Hello, thank you very much. <laughs> And then thirdly, somebody like Tristan. So Tristan, Chef Tristan has been with me okay. for eight years. Okay. So, so when people want a quick success, look at Tristan. Right. This is his restaurant now. Right. But it took him eight years to get to this point. Right on. And Tristan is Trinidadian. Mm -hmm. He's South Carolinian. Mm -hmm. He lived in New York, of course, to mm -hmm. train. But he also lived in Texas. He, wow. We sent him to Sweden. Yeah. Right? Wow. So this is it, the way the four or five years, we were busy these four years it took to exactly. build the place. So Tristan was in London and Sweden. Okay. Talk about Steve McQueen, because I want him to understand that blackness is just a tad off different totally. in, in, in the UK. Yeah. The isms are of the same, but the, yeah. how it lands, yeah. right? It's just different. And, and Trist, so Tristan embodies all of that. Take it all in. So the fact that we can, we have our tamarind tree here, that we have guava on the menu that we never have in New York. Right. The fact that we are inspired by, you know, Caribbean pickles. Yeah. More than, men than Southern pickles. The more that we look at jerk, we look at other spice rubs, mm -hmm. um, you know, and our staff. Mm -hmm. We have Cubans, of course, Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. Um, Colombians, mm -hmm. H, uh, Bahama, Bohemians, all sure. of that. So it, it's the, the four walls and the spirit and what it says on the door is the same. But once you enter it, you got to recognize yourself. Oh, yeah. But yet it's going to be expressed very differently. Yeah. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about yeah. walking in. I just, mm -hmm. you know, just did another yeah. kind of go round. And it's not just the art. Mm. which you know i can i can do that yeah but it's the atmosphere and the feeling created mm. from even the, the the way that the benches are put together yeah I mean, you feel this sense of of blackness that is um as you say there are there are uh yeah it's it's how it lands mm -hmm. differently in these places and but our friend derek fleming mm -hmm. is really the one that has threaded this yeah for, you know, I don't know how many trips he's done yeah. from New York to Florida. Oh my gosh, I, I know. <laughs> and you, you think about it, racing two boys at yeah. the same time. Yeah. And so when I sit here, it's, it's a tribe of hundred, yeah. but I have to point out someone like the Simpkin family, Michael, Nikki. Of course. Yeah. That through every stop and start yeah. said, no, we're going to do it. Yeah. And, and, and Derek, deep, deep tissue and understanding the amount of arguments of, of how this floor should flow to, and, and, and I, I adore that passion yeah. because without that commitment, yep. none of this happens. Doesn't happen, right? It doesn't happen. Yeah. Amazing. Um, so, so we're here, we're thinking about Miami. You also have New York. Um, you've done different projects and you've managed to to put out several books, mm -hmm. um, done some television programs. What would you like to do next? 
I know we're here. We're, we're celebrating. But I know you're, you're already on to something else. That I'm here. I'm like, <laughs> we opened a something. restaurant during COVID. <laughs> that was there worse. is so next. <laughs> but before, first, congratulations. <laughs> But only in America can someone say, it. what do I you know, mean? I know. I love that thought. That's but ambition. You were like, I remember this uh, we, because we were going to open a while ago. Yes, we were. And we are in COVID environment. Yes. But oh my God, you, you did something incredibly special. Mm -hmm. The beginning of summertime yeah. it was. And, you know, the pivot to, to, to doing what you can yeah. Um, yeah. Was, was amazing. Where does For, that come from? We... Well, it comes from that hut. Yeah. Uh, you handed out meals. I, I mean. We handed out thousands and thousands of meals. Yeah. But I also think we became part of Miami's fabrics of restaurant yeah. because of it. Yeah. Right? You never know what's going to happen during trauma. Yeah. You either go towards it or you go away from it. And if you go towards it, it's going to hurt. Yeah. But it also is going to... You're going to get something. You're going to get something. To have, and we needed to know who we were in this community. Yeah. We can't come here and build this incredible restaurant in overtime and don't be there on the bad days. It's our duty to be there on all the days. Yeah. Um, yes, it's a little bit inconvenient. Yes, yeah. we're not going to be as fast and nimble. Yeah. But it's our job to be here. Uh, we, can't, we can't pick yeah. what days we choose to be here. Um, and put on that cape and you're going to do something. Well, let's do it. You yeah. know? And I mean, I've been, hell, I mean, if it wouldn't be for organizations like UNICEF and the Red Cross that has sure. completely helped me in the stage of my life, I, hear you. I have to, uh, you have to do this. And we did it in New York, we did it in Newark, yeah. but we couldn't do it without the staff. And the staff were the ones that said, I show up, the volunteers said, yeah. The farmers that provided food for us, yeah. the, the, the not so wealthy people that said, here's a hundred dollar check. I, I, sure. That's all I got, yeah. but please cook with it. I mean, the yeah. humility, I've seen the best of Miami yeah. through this experience in the worst of its time. Amazing.